considering I'm running from one teaching assignment to another and uh, hoping that our Indian standard time just sticks to standard time and not stretch time. But praise be to the Lord that uh, God gave me an opportunity to share exactly on the same theme that, that I got to preach last year. Um, I thirst. Um, increasingly it's becoming my favorite verse among the seven. Uh, as I literally spent hours grappling with, with this theme of I thirst. This is the shortest of the seven words. In fact, I thirst may be in English two phrase, a two letter or two word phrase, but in Greek it's just one. Short and sweet it is. But to the Lord, it is not short and sweet. It is bitter and tasteless. And so, when we turn our attention to, to the last verse in John 19, I want to spend a different angle or a different slant, if you will, this year. While I examine, like last year, the physiological aspects of thirst, of how a human body increasingly finds itself hungry uh, for fluids, uh, I spent a fair amount of time last year. But this time I want to understand and explore the theological dimensions of why this thirst is relevant to us even today, 2,000 years later. But before we actually get to the cross, I want to take you into Old Testament. I want to take you to another story of one of Jesus' ancestors, King David. There's a fascinating story in 2 Samuel chapter 23, where King David is hiding, is on the run from the Philistines. He looks at his hometown, Bethlehem. He's becoming very nostalgic about what his home used to be. And then suddenly, a craving, a wave of thirst envelops King David. Home away from home, his kingdom robbed, Helpless, with a bunch of his henchmen on the run, King David looks soulfully, yearning towards what used to be his glorious mansion back in Bethlehem. He says, I thirst for the waters from the well next to the gates of Bethlehem. I thirst for the waters. There is something about a human condition that when you're facing extreme duress or extremely stressful situation, the human body goes into a wave of a passionate hunger and a need. And I think King David was experiencing that. He doesn't even ask his people, his, his mighty men around him. He doesn't even say, go and get me his water. They listen to that expression of thirst. They go break through the Philistine garrison, go into Bethlehem, go into that well and bring him some water. David takes that water and he throws it and says, I could not jeopardize the lives of my men just for a glass of water. There's something fundamental about human thirst uh, under extremely duressful situations. So when we look at thirst in the context of John 19, we need to remember that Jesus has said that not as a helpless man just dying on the cross, extremely exasperated, extremely hungry, extremely thirsty, he didn't say, I, I need water just to survive, but the word says, to fulfill scriptures. And that's where I want to spend a bulk of my time. Why is the Lord bent upon fulfilling scriptures? What is the in extricate relationship between fulfilling scriptures and accomplishing prophecies? There is something fundamental about Jesus' mission that he is always bent upon accomplishing some scripture somewhere, some prophecy somewhere, a word said by his uh, predecessors elsewhere in the Old Testament. Let me give you a, a, a couple of examples. The Gospel of John says, Law came from Moses, but grace and truth came from Jesus. And every time a word was spoken, it, it is actually a, a mission that he is fulfilling to, to complete uh, God's commandment. Let me cast your mind to Matthew chapter 4. Jesus went hungry after 40 days and 40 nights of fasting. Now many people may have fasted during this Lent season. And you know that it takes a toll on your body. 
And so after 40 days and 40 nights, the very first temptation the devil throws at him is, if you are the son of God, take these rocks and convert them to vulnerable, helpless, almost at the point of physical collapse. The very first temptation that he has to battle is if you are the son. Now there are two aspects to that and I will get to that second aspect in a moment. But Jesus and his response was not to just get into a, a slanging match with the devil. Jesus' words start with, it is written. Here is the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Here is the second part in God's triune being. The very Lord of creation appealing to a word which is, it is written. So sacred, so sacrosanct is his authority to the word of God that the very response, the very first words he uttered in Matthew to the devil was, it is written. And then the temptation continues. The second temptation, third temptation, each of that response was, it is written. So focused was he on accomplishing the word. Now, that, that model of devil's temptation has not changed since, since Adam and Eve. He goes to Adam and he does exactly the same thing. Is it true that God said, he removes the authority of God from our lives and puts us in temptation? And that's a lesson for us. If Jesus Christ continued to breathe even to the last moment, just as the world to succumb on Calvary, he says, I want to fulfill the scripture and therefore I say I thirst. How much more should we have the supremacy of the word of God in our lives? So the second part that I wanted to talk about was Jesus not only was the most grace giving man, he was the most graceful man ever. What do I mean by grace? Now, he at every point in all his miracles, he used the word of God. He went and forgave sins. And he said, it's easy for me to forgive, it's easy for me to heal, but he also continuously kept referring to the word of God. So not only in the normal course of his life, he actually uh, held supreme the word of God. In the lowest point in his temptations in his life, did he uh, hold on to the supremacy of God? He also held it even the highest point in his life. If you go to Matthew 17, on the Mount of Transfiguration, he appears himself in all his full glory to his three disciples. And then the disciples say, Lord, let's build tents here. Let's make a living here. Let's make a tent house. Let's make a log cabin here. Let's live here. Immediate response after his highest point on human uh, journey was for the Son of Man has come to seek and save the lost. He appeals back to the scripture. In fact, if you take away the, the, the commitment to scriptures, you would actually remove a significant component of God's, Jesus' stint on earth. There is no way you can explain how intricately these two are connected. The only way you can explain is in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was and because his word personified at every stage his heart beat kept responding to the power of God's word. The, one of the words that the devil tried to do was to remove God out of the equation or God's word out of the equation. A psychologist defined ego as edging God out. Next time you remember somebody showing you ego, you might remember that. Ego can be defined. Not a very scientific definition, but ego is edging God out. The devil was trying to edge God out of Jesus' plan, but God kept com continuously coming back to the word of God and keeping God in the central part of, of, of his salvation. Consider Jesus as you, as you are crucified. Watch him handle his crucifixion. He gave us the example of how the most cruel form of punishment ever invited by the Romans, he handled it as if it's a piece of art. Think about that. He was in ignominious company. I was sharing on the second word earlier on. And he was not in exalted company when, when those two condemned sinners were there. 
You know, when you're hanging on the cross, you're devoid of all your clothes. Uh, another parable that I could give is King Naaman in, in the Old Testament was asked to go into the Jordan River and dip seven times. You know what is the biggest problem for King Naaman to go into Jordan River and dip? A general has to remove all his ornate badges, his ranks, his everything. Jesus Christ on the cross hung without his purple robe, without his cloak, without he just, like the book of Job says, naked I came into this world, naked will I leave. As he hung there in the lowest point of his life, in exalted, almost in the company of angels, he was, he arrived into this world. Let me conclude with a story that, uh, a conversation of uh, two, two friends that happened in a London underground train. A friend was a Christian, his friend was a non-Christian. So his friend, the unbeliever, asked this Christian man, if somebody came and told you that in London a child is born without a father, would you believe it? He was making fun of his faith. So the, the Christian man looked at him and said, yes, I would, if only that child continued to live the way Jesus did. Would you live? Would you believe if somebody told you that someone was born without a father and the Christian said, yes, I would, if that child grew up to be like Jesus the way he lived. But if somebody asked me the same question, I would say, yeah, I would, if only he also died the way Jesus died. The supremacy of the word of God, the, the, the genuine lasting commitment to the word is unshakable as, as, as exemplified in the life of Jesus Christ. All of us live our lives based on something, based on some worldviews, based on some philosophy, based on some set of ideas. Jesus anchored his life on the world. It defined his mission, it defined his choices, even to the point of death on the cross of Calvary. And here's, here's my concluding thought. The devil's birth, or the way the devil evolved was, although an angel, he tried to make himself equal with God, and that's why he was cast out. My Lord, according to Philippians 2, says, although equal with God, he did not consider equality with God as something to be grasped for, but he came, obeyed himself to death, and not just death, but death on the cross. Even where we had to, he had to say, in the most vulnerable of human beings, I thirst. I thirst, as human as it could be. Between God sitting on the throne and the cross, there was a river of life, the book of Revelation says. If only he cried out to his angels, wouldn't some of his angels dip a jar of water and breathe and quench the Lord's thirst? But no, he did it to fulfill scriptures. May the authority of the word of God continue to inspire us. May, our, may we stake our lives so much so that we live a reckless, abandonous life where, where we can just stake our lives on the word of God. May the Lord bless this word. Thank you very much.